is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Activism. Now, here's Jeff. It is hour three of the Jeff Santos Show. Welcome to it, folks. We are live in the South Coast in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, coming to you live here uh, on this Friday edition of the program. We'll be uh, speaking with our good friend uh, Mark Taylor Canfield coming up at 5.30 today, the Renaissance Man, live from a, uh, uh, a clipper ship uh, that uh, is now in Puget Sound. We'll be uh, talking to the Renaissance Man uh, at 5.34 from Seattle. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santo Show that you're tuned into. We're heavy Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern, 12 to 3 Pacific time. And we are on tape delay in the great uh, state of Wisconsin uh, on a great 92.7 FM video uh, from 7 to 10 Central Time. Uh, check us out, folks, if you are there in the great Badger State, in the capital city of the Badger State. Uh, we go west from Wisconsin uh, across the uh, United States of America, and we find ourselves in Puget Sound. That is is just on the edge of Seattle, WA. That is where we find our next guest. He is the Renaissance Man. He is uh, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield, and he is on a ship, I think some kind of a clipper ship, and he's coming into harbor as we speak. Mark, you have conquered the great Northwest, and now you're back to grab a brewski. Great to have you back with us, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good, Jeff. Uh, Ships Ahoy, Helmsley, and all that. Uh, I've been crewing on a, a replica of a 1780s brigantine, actually a brig. In the United States, they call it a brig. It has two masts with square sails, but it's all built uh, per specifications for the ship that was originally built in Boston, uh, best shipbuilders in the world. Um by for for Captain Gray Robert Gray because he was an explorer he, he was commissioned to explore the Northwest and the Pacific Rim China Japan open up trade routes uh, make contact with the native people here in the Northwest and uh, do some charting I mean of course you know the native people knew all about these places but no American ship had been around one Cape Horn and no American ship had ever visited, uh, been across the bar at what came to be called Gray's Harbor, which is right on the coast of Washington, on the Pacific coast. So this ship is owned by the Gray's Harbor uh, Historical Seaport. It's a foundation, and so people donate, you know, to, to keep it going, and it gets grants and stuff. So it's all nonprofit, and they teach people about maritime history. You can sign up to learn how to crew a ship like this. And this particular tour started in Grace Harbor in Westport, Washington, where I grew up doing a lot of fishing with my dad out on commercial boats and stuff. We headed from there and sports fishing. And then we headed from there up the coast north all the way to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is way, way, way up on the north edge of the Olympic Peninsula across uh, the channel from Vancouver Island in Canada. Uh, went by the San Juan Islands, which is a beautiful retreat, a lot of writers and People uh, from other cities like to do major careers in L.A. and stuff like to go up there to get away from things. We went by the San Juans and Friday Harbor and then down south through the Salish Sea, uh, Puget Sound. And then now we're coming into the inland water system, which is quite extensive as well. And so uh, Elliott Bay um, outside of Seattle, uh, that's where Seattle's located is Elliott Bay. And it's um, connected to Lake Union by the Ballard Locks because the lake is about nine feet higher than sea level, and then that's connected with Lake Washington. So you could spend, you know, days doing nothing but touring the inland waterways now that they're all connected ever since, you know, the early 1900s when the Army Corps of Engineers connected these lakes. So, yeah, we're getting back. I'm sore from hauling on lines because these masts are 90 feet tall. It's a 112-foot ship, and it takes all of your body weight uh, to pull on those lines and get those sails up. But we had a. Well, I want to interrupt you for a second because I don't know if people can hear the seagulls in the background. But we went from uh, talking to our good friend uh, and uh, the great Progressive Democrats of America, Executive Director 
Uh, and uh, the City of Angels uh, there, Alan Minsky, who has a rooster in the background, uh, it's Seagulls with uh, our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield. Folks, if you don't think that we travel uh, around the world here uh, to give you the uh, natural sound of America, uh, around the country, I should say, uh, then I don't know what else. But there you go, the Seagulls in the background. Are you close to shore yet? Have you landed on the yeah, harbor we're front? Getting close to, we're getting close to Lake Union where we can, I mean, there are plenty of bars that are open now. Things are opening up again in Seattle, although the White hmm. Swan has been open throughout the pandemic because they have had outdoor seating. So, uh, but there's another place, you know, a lot of the restaurants are changing and bars, the way they're, they're serving people and doing things are changing. So one of the new ideas is this thing called Capster, and that's right next to where we're going to moor, which is... Uh, Tapster is a is a sort of a bar, but when you go in there, just you know, taps all along the wall, kind of like some of the German tap rooms here, where you know they have hundreds of different kinds of beer on tap. And so you you go up and you just swipe your card, and then you get this little guest card thing, and you put it in the device above each tap, and you pour your own. So you can, if you don't want a full pint or a schooner, you can just take a few sips of this and test that. And so you can, it's also kind of a testing room. We can try all sorts of different great IPAs and microbrews from the Pacific Northwest. So that's probably where we'll go. And I think, you know, Seattle is, is changing in terms of the way that it's providing services for people. There's going to be more of that kind of thing. There's going to be more uh, street seating. We just heard that from the city that a lot of the restaurants are going to continue to open streets. Uh, actually, they're actually blocking a few streets in order to open up for outdoor seating for restaurants. So we're turning into like Paris now all of a sudden. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be like when it's miserable in the winter, but in the spring and summer, where the when the weather's beautiful here, it'll be great. Well, I'm all Get for it. I, I want to I want to eat at all these outdoor cafes. I'm looking forward to doing that yeah. uh, as the and summer begins here in another week or so. Yeah. Uh, we we did it a couple of days ago, uh, family and friends. But I I'm, I'm interested in in something, Mark, that we've talked about on this show quite a bit, and it's uh, it's quote unquote under the hard news, and then we've been talking a little bit about about Seattle and the fun stuff. But I just got the phone with Joe Sandberg, of course, uh, one of our sponsors, and uh, at the same time a a great uh, potential uh, candidate for uh, uh, governor in California, maybe even senator. And, you know, we're talking about the unhoused. And, again, it's a term that, thankfully, people have talked about. Uh, You talk about homeless. uh, And you talk about cost of housing. And, you know, you have talked about on on the program many times that there is this outrageous uh, cost. Uh, we're not far from where you live in Capitol Hill, a great neighborhood in the city of Seattle. You know, but all the way, all the way around. If you take thirty thousand view, that's that's what it is. Talk to me about that if you can. The last count, last houseless count in Seattle uh, and King County, Martin Luther King Jr. County. I'm sure that Dr. King would not be proud of this, this statistic. Over 4,000 people are without permanent residence. So that means they're living under bridges and streets and tent cities. Uh, the mayor who claimed to me when she was running for office, uh, Jenny Durkin, former U.S. attorney under the Obama administration, told me every person in Seattle deserves to have a place to live, but they continue to raid homeless encampments here. I just uh, took part in a movie film uh, filming here with uh, Steven Soderbergh where... That film is about homelessness in Seattle. So it's a big issue here. It's huge in Los Angeles. It's always been huge in San Francisco for a very, very long time. The only good news I have to tell you about that is that as of this week, uh, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin has signed a bill that will continue the uh, moratorium on evictions within the city of Seattle until September 30th. So... You know, a lot of these programs started during the pandemic because people were losing their jobs, they're losing losing their apartments and houses. Um, but I, it looks to me, Jeff, like some of this more, uh, shall we call it, democratic socialism, or you know, let's help out the little guy kind of uh, programs may continue in some form because Seattle has never had rent control due to a, a statewide ban by the state legislature, um, but. You know, we can do things like this in Seattle if we want um, to help alleviate the problem. And it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of political will, um, but it can happen. But that's the the good news so far is that September 30th, until September 30th, 
uh, you don't have to worry about getting kicked out of your, your housing in Seattle. Um, now, that hasn't um, alleviated the thousands of people that are living on the streets and that are in encampments around the city. That continues. And it is one of those issues, as you said, that just never seems to be brought up um, by either the political parties or the mainstream corporate news media anywhere in this country. That and, you know, the fact that we're ranked 44th in terms of press freedom in the world, that those stories are just never covered because it's, they're embarrassing. And the powers that be don't really like to cover that stuff. So, you know, but I'm hoping when these uh, music um, venues and restaurants open that there will be more employment for people that might help. Uh, we do have a $15 an hour minimum wage here. Um, and people do tend to tip pretty generously here because they understand how hard it is to be a service worker and survive with the high rents here. Um, but I think, you know, we, as of July 4th, um, a lot of the uh, clubs and bars are going to be reopening, um, some with restrictions and some with just a few restrictions. But And then actually tomorrow, the, normally there's a huge festival in Seattle, and a lot of people gather at these things. Um, and it does give people who don't have a place to live and have any money a place to go and enjoy themselves. So every year there's the Fremont Solstice Parade. And it's huge, and there's huge floats, and it's just a big party, and bands play live at Gasworks Park and all this. Well, that, those events were canceled, but instead they're having a Fremont Neighborhood Art Walk, where people can go on their own self-guided tours of these galleries, where there's you know some limited occupa- uh, um, occupation, but you can get in there. And then there's um, the Art Car Show, which uh, people in this part of town are famous for their art cars. So they take uh, vintage model cars and uh, create art uh, projects out of them. So you'll see, you know, like the Walt Disney car, you know, with Mickey Mouse is everywhere on the car. You'll see like cars that look like dragons and breathe fire and all sorts of crazy stuff. Kind of like some of the things you would see at Burning Man. And those will be available to, uh, for the public to enjoy tomorrow all day long in Fremont. So it does look like things are starting to open up. I just hope that, um, when we get a few more free festivals going again and people can hang out, that they'll also think about this issue of uh, poverty and how, you know, this corporate takeover of Seattle has only added to the problem of, you know, skyrocketing rents and the high cost of real estate to the point where the cost of living here is just too expensive for the working folks. And, you know, we do have a few people, maybe a couple of mayoral candidates that say they're going to try to address that. Um, and then, we've, you know, we've had uh, Shama Swan on the city council, a Democratic Socialist uh, city council member for a while. So there are some efforts. But, but she is not running for uh, mayor, correct? No, no. Actually, she is, uh, ready. She is um, staying with the city council at this point. Although there is another um, candidate for city council, Nikita Oliver, and she is a member of the People's Party, which is an alternative party. And they are a part of a larger network, I think, a coalition of groups, including small businesses and labor and political parties that... Um, help get a, uh, candidates elected in Seattle. And that would include the Green Party as well and, the, and progressive Democrats. So I think they'll be able to get somebody in the mayor's office who will have a more progressive um, bent than Mayor Jenny Durkin right now. But it's just the history of Seattle that people run on very progressive platforms. And then once they get into office, reality uh, you know, sets in and all of a sudden Amazon and Boeing and Microsoft and, you know, and Google or are, are Starbucks are breathing down their neck. And so they tend to change their stripes, so to speak. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, we're, we're hoping it's not like the Who song again, you know, meet the new boss, uh, same as the old boss. But yeah. homelessness is, I think, a major, major issue across the country that nobody is dealing with adequately. And it has to be addressed now. We can't wait. We're talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santos Show as uh, we make our way to the top of the hour and the end of the uh, week here on the program. Again, next week we're looking forward to talking with Nina Turner, a uh, candidate for Congress in the uh, great city of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, we're looking also forward to, to our good friend, the great Reverend, uh, who is, um, in my opinion, a, a, a fantastic uh, fantastic uh, advocate for the Poor People's Campaign uh, and his uh, and his work, uh, Reverend Barber, of course. Um, I I am wondering, you know, if if you think, Mark, that Seattle and I've asked you this before, you know, can be, you know, the the epicenter 
where it used to be in San Francisco and in many smaller places like Madison and so forth, and Burlington, Vermont, for that matter. But I think it still has the ability. I mean, you guys led on the minimum wage. Uh, you guys led on the uh, $15 an hour. You led on marijuana uh, legalization. Um, I'm wondering if there is one issue that you think you in Seattle – I don't mean you personally, but the city of Seattle and, and the activists behind, uh, you know, uh, behind Jayapal, behind Sawant, can kind of lead where the rest of the country can follow. Is there one thing that you think about? Maybe it's housing. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, actually, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I, the first thing I got, I did when I got up this morning is check out the new tracks for our band. Um, and that made me think that Seattle should be leading the world in the music in, in breaking new and innovative bands, especially rock and roll. So I'm hoping that that will happen around July 4th, Independence Day. We will gain our independence as artists and musicians again and be able to play. Um, but in terms of, of, of a political or government type of, gen- of agenda, I would say I would like to see this. And I'm not sure. Honestly, Je- I'm not sure if it's possible. I would like to believe it is possible. I would like to see Seattle lead in police reform. Oh, and yes. I know that's, that's a, a great stretch. one. Yeah. We, it's a long stretch, a big stretch, because we have been far behind on that curve. It's, you know, a topic of conversation at Democracy Watch News and amongst my friends all the time. Why do some of the most progressive cities in the country have the worst police departments? Well, we got to solve that problem. So it's a, it's a mark on our um, good record as a city, and we need to do something about that. Now, there have been some inroads in that direction, and we do have the case down in Tacoma, where two police officers have been charged with second-degree murder in the killing of Manny Ellis, Manuel Ellis, so that's become uh, an international movement, you know, for justice there, but we need to see that in Seattle. We need to see um, a whole new way of policing, and I think Seattle has a lot of good ideas. There are council members who have some good ideas. There are a whole lot of Black Lives Matter activists and the Black Action Coalition here, they have some great ideas about it. The Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee, they should be talking with the city council and the mayor every day about this issue and coming up with some very, very um, uh, practical and efficient solutions to what's been going on. Now, we've already started that process by turning over the 911 call center to civilians, um, and there's been a, an attempt to ban the use of those you know nasty crowd control munitions and that I've suffered from at the protests. Um, there has been some headway on that, but then there's also been the pushback by the police department and the police guild on some of these issues. So it's a difficult process. It's not something that pe- the people on the other side of the issue are willing to um, give in to easily. It, it comes with a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, political uh, organization. It, it's not going to be just one council member or one mayor that's going to get this done. It's got to be the community as a whole. Everybody's got to come together and do that. I'm hoping the same thing is going to happen in Minneapolis, in Portland, and in Tacoma, where you know mm. we've had these tragic killings over and over, and we've well, got to stop. So let's, that's let's, my, let's, my wish. Okay. Well, I think that's, that's a good wish. wish, and I think it's a real, real, realistic situation. Let's go to Minneapolis and talk to our good friend John, who, of course, was uh, the epicenter uh, with the Floyd trial. Uh, John, what you, when you're listening to Mark here, I mean, I'm wondering now, I, I heard Keith Ellison, uh, you know, endorse Mar- My- Myla Wiley, who's concerned about police reforming in the New York City's mayor's race, and she's making some momentum. I think she's in third place now. I mean, is Keith Ellison being, whether it's uh, New York or Seattle, is, is he sort of trying to... You know, do what he did in, in, in getting a guilty verdict. I don't know when they're actually doing the sentencing here. Um, but it would seem to me that, you know, what he did successfully, a lot of other progressive cities, as Mark Taylor Canfield is talking about, uh, would be, you know, looking to find, well, how is uh, the blueprint there? Maybe it works in our city. Yeah, yeah I, I think that uh, he is taking over the high you know, these prof- uh, high-profile uh, uh, cases uh, like George Floyd and Durante Wright uh, and, you know, taking them from uh, Hennepin County. Uh, and uh, so the fact that he is in that position is uh, excellent because he conducted an absolutely perfect uh, trial. But uh, what we're working on politically is to prevent uh, these things from happening in the, in the first place. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, the Charter Commission uh, will probably be, um, you know, eliminated, or what will happen is, uh, you know, we will no longer have our police department uh, tied to population, and instead uh, we are going to have a Department of Public Safety. And uh, so these are excellent ideas. I know somebody that uh, did that kind of work in New York, uh, in Nassau County, New York, outside of New York City. And uh, if there's an art to diffusing people who are having or who are, who are in mental crisis rather than, you know, call somebody that's just going to shoot them dead, which is what happens uh, nine times out of ten, especially if they're people of color. So, uh, and, you know, my own city council person, he's on the way out over both the housing issue and I would say also as a result of George uh, Floyd, and we have an African-American candidate who is uh, young and very, uh, and he is being endorsed by the party. Now, the the, the other candidate or the former um well, actually, he's our present city council person. He's still going to run. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to work out, but I don't think he's going to get, uh, he's going to win. I think that, uh, this, uh, his last name is Payne. He's, he's, he got my support and I voted for him in the, in the caucus. So, mm. uh, and he's got the, you know, DFL or the Democratic Farm Labor Party support. Yeah, and that's, he that's has a good some thing. Really good issues, you know. So yeah, no, at the I. Time, are changing as they say. Yeah, know, well, really, Bobby Dylan would be proud of you. There, he's, a, he's another hippie Minnesota yeah. guy. There you go. Right. Uh, let yeah. me ask you, Mark. We look at the Ferguson, your attorney general there, and maybe like Ellison can kind of take things away from some of the more I wouldn't say corrupt, but uh, some of the more uh, slow to reform leaders. Whether it's your mayor in Seattle, maybe some other officials. Is that at all something that Ferguson would do? Mark Taylor Canfield uh, is still there? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Bob Ferguson has already taken on the case uh, of uh, the killing of Manny Ellis by the Tacoma police. So he's already begun to do that. Um, Good. What I was thinking about when when we were hearing from Minneapolis is that we have uh, Bruce Harrell, the former uh, president of the Seattle City Council, a black man running for uh, mayor. We have uh, Colleen Echohawk, uh, a member of the Pani Nation, who's running. We have uh, Lorena Gonzalez. Uh, um, we also have uh, Omar. It's a pretty diverse Tahir. group. These are all people of color, and I guarantee you that one of them is going to win. And that's just the direction that the city is going. And all of them Great. have a good record on issues of, of holding police accountable. So, also, we have Nikita Oliver, who's running for position number four in the city council. She's a member. I was trying to talk to her about, about her before, but I got sidetracked. She's a member of the People's Party, and she has a coalition of people behind her that um, could totally get her elected as well. So, we could have, you know, a different look uh, of, uh, in the city of Seattle, and hopefully that kind of representation will transfer to a true reform of the police department and get rid of all this racial profiling and racism and excessive use of force and all that that's been going on here for years. So that's I'm fantastic. That, um, we'll see a change, yeah, for sure. Well, it, it is a, such a critical thing, and John, thank you for bringing up those points. Appreciate uh, your your perspective there in the great city of Minneapolis, which I think is going to lead, really lead uh, in a lot of ways. As Mr. Ellison is, uh, I think, going to have a a major rage role again. This guy's a former uh, member of Congress, and of course, was within thirteen votes before Obama and company fixed it uh, for uh, for Mr. Perez, who's now uh, anti union after being the uh, <laughs> labor secretary. My world. Uh, um, well, Mark, you know, we're coming to the end of uh, the line here. I will just say, enjoy your trip uh, around Puget Sound and uh, around Lake Washington and wherever else the boat is going. And uh, enjoy your weekend, my friend. I appreciate it. Yeah, if, you know, you can check out more about the boat. At, just put Lady Washington in, in the search engine and you can find out more about the ship. It's really cool. I'll be posting some um, video on my YouTube channel. So if you guys want to check out my music and the journalism that I do. You can go to my YouTube channel, just Mark Taylor Canfield at YouTube. And then, of course, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, like everybody else, right? We're all on social networks these days. So, anyway, it's been a, it's been a great day, and I'm really enjoying the summer. It's really nice to see you there. Hey.
Hey, thank you, Mark. Enjoy. Talk to you next Friday. All the best. I want to thank Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. Folks, thank you for participating in the great calls, the great emails and uh, and texts to me. Appreciate them all. We'll be back on Monday. Again, Nina Turner sometime next week. Hopefully, Reverend Barber, too. Keep on fighting peacefully. Have a nice weekend, folks. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I gotta go. I. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Investing. Activism. And now, here's Jeff. It is hour three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. If you lie from a uh, cloudy south coast today, uh, we've had a couple of days of sunshine after a horrific uh, weekend of 45 degree temperatures and pouring rain and wind. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty amazingly uh, nice hot weekend. You're going to be in the 90s, I think, on Sunday and Monday. My God, we're going to be like Washington, D.C. Uh, in the summertime, except maybe not as humid. Then again, Washington, D.C., humidity. Hmm. Well, then nobody knows about humidity and the Washington, D.C. game uh, and the economic game that goes on and uh, all the lies of corporate America that finds its way uh, through the major networks and so forth. Uh, then our uh, next guest, he is regularly here every Thursday at 5 p.m. He is the great Rob Scott, senior uh, economist at the Great Economic Policy Institute. And we say hello to Mr. Rob. Happy Thursday, Rob. Hope the weather is not too hot down there in D.C. just quite yet. Oh, not too hot, but we're getting our usual spring-summer rain uh, uh, of uh, thunderstorms are about to land on my head as we speak. <laughs> oh, uh, that's well, par for the course down here in, uh, in Washington. I know. I remember that very well in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, uh, yes, those afternoon 5 o'clock thunderstorms. All your local newscasts are going to go, oh, there's going to be thunderstorms. Oh, my God. So be careful. What else uh, do? Yeah, Channel 4. I remember that very well. Um, Okay, so (laughs) uh, we got lots to talk about. Um, Our um, great caller base and listener base is on fire uh, about this filibuster. But before we get to that uh, and get your thoughts on how important this is, uh, the economic concerns here um, are are very much up and up. Up for uh, debate. There's a lot of this stuff. Oh, well, we're getting all these new jobs coming in, and nobody needs to hire. We need to hire all these people and all this stuff. Look, hold on a second. I know you got numbers for me. You know, it wasn't a great last month. You know, the the idea that uh, there's all these jobs and everybody is hiring people at uh, you know thirty bucks an hour is full of malarkey, to use Mr. Biden's favorite term. Um, Give us the reality here of what is going on and how much this country needs, uh, you know, continuation of, of aid. And that may come in different forms. Some of it may be 2K a month. Some of it may be incentives to, to get a, a great infrastructure plan and great good jobs and good wages that are union-based. There's a lot of different ways to skin the cat here. For those who uh, are, are very big cat fans, I'm not talking about it literally. Uh, I think you know what I'm, what I'm, where I'm aiming at, uh, Rob. Um, give me your lowdown on where we are in reality here in uh, June of 2021. Well, Jeff, I'm afraid we're in the summer doldrums here in Washington. Uh, Congress has gone home for the week, and when they come back, I'm afraid that uh, the prospects for progress on infrastructure or voting rights uh, or gun control or any of the priorities of the Democrats are going to be just... Uh, you know, a, a, a distant uh, vision in the future, a, a dream. But uh, so far, that we've seen very little progress on the Biden agenda, aside from the passage of the uh, American Recovery Plan, which was a huge victory and, and incredibly important to keeping the economy going as we dig our way out of the COVID pandemic. But it can't be one and done because that's not enough, Correct. Absolutely not, and Biden knows this. That was the lesson learned in the Biden administration when they passed uh, the recovery plan in 2008, and then there was no follow-up act. In fact, uh, government spending was cut uh, beginning in 2010, and that led to the very stagnant recovery we had over the last decade, between 2010 and 2020, when we were uh, stuck with chronically low job growth, 
and chronically high unemployment and stagnant wages. And the reason was that Congress refused to spend the money needed to get the economy fully recovered. And it was a conscious uh, plan uh, put in place by none other than our good friend Mitch McConnell, who is still Mm. here today and still standing Mm. in the way of progress. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Mr., uh, uh, you know, deny, uh, delete, and uh, destroy, uh, you know, man. And uh, that's what he's been doing uh, for the years he's been in the uh, uh, United States Congress, both as a member of Congress and a senator, of course. Um, well, I, I, I do want to get to the point where hopefully uh, something will happen here, and uh, Mr. Manchin and Ms. Cinema will get what's coming to them. I believe, and I think that uh, you know we are hearing from our members of uh, the listening audience is that uh, we got to throw the entire kitchen sink at these two folks and tag them with. Uh, basically a Jim Crow of 2021 for the rest of their lives uh, on their tombstones. And uh, that's sort of where we need to go. Now, if we can get to, uh, you know, some kind of uh, negotiation uh, behind the scenes and Biden invite him over to Camp David and, you know, more croissants and whatever else they're going to need, uh, you know, to get people to go to yes, fine, I'm all for it. But we're running out of, uh, uh, you know, days for candy and carrots. Um but I'm, I think it's really important, uh, Rob, for people to understand that if we don't get H.R. 1, not only are people losing uh, their right to vote, which is, you know, a, a tragedy beyond uh, tragedies. Um, you know, we're now heading into a, a Gestapo-like uh, fascist state. But... If you look at it from a pure economic perspective, and you're not necessarily looking at just people of color, you're looking at poor white people that come from the Indianas and where you came from and the Illinois that we get uh, a lot of calls from in Chicago, uh, you know, to our good friends in Wisconsin listening to us today uh, on the great uh, 92 7 FM in Madison and all around uh, the Midwest that there are a lot of white working class voters who believe the Trump nonsense, the BS. And they found out a lot of them went to Biden. A lot of them, you know, continue to believe the the uh, uh, ridiculous, um, you know, con man. But that's the reality. I mean, if you don't get progressive legislation that you've been talking about for a long time and that we've talked about on this show, it's going to affect everybody who makes 35 k a year, who makes 75 k a year, and who makes over who makes 100 k a year. I mean, everybody else above that, yeah, they'll be fine. They'll figure a way to do it. You know, they're fine right now. But if you're, you know, a middle class American, a working class American, you're going to get screwed. I don't care, you know, how light color skin you are. You know, I don't care if your name is Smith or Jones. You're going to get it the same way because the Republicans are going to basically leave nothing to the rest of the folks. They're giving it to the 1%, and that is it. Your thoughts on that? Well, Jeff, I think that's absolutely right. And what we've seen in this recession, this recovery and recession, the great COVID, the COVID recession, uh, or depression, as might be a better word, uh, is a tremendous pulling apart of the haves and the have-nots. And basically, those at the top, those who have college degrees or advanced degrees in particular, have done very, very well, and everybody else has suffered. You've really got three large groups of people in the economy. There are roughly today 22 million workers who've been just decimated by uh, the COVID recession. There, there are uh, eight, uh, 9 to 11 million workers who are uh, unemployed, out of, out of work, and on the unemployment payrolls. There are another 10 to 15 million uh, additional workers who are either un- uh, miscounted or who have or suffered from uh, lost hours or who can't participate in the labor force because they have children or other family members to care for. So that's the bottom... 15% of the labor force. They've been hammered. Uh, the, the rest of the working class labor force, those who don't have college degrees, very few of those workers, uh, shown in a new report by my colleagues, uh, at least Gold and Jory Kanda, uh, only about 5% of those workers can telecommute. 95% of those working class workers have to go to work on the job, where they're forced to confront with health risks and hostile uh, uh, customers every day. Uh, they're working in dangerous environments, uh, so they've uh, 
uh, you know, they suffered a real decline in the quality of, the li- of living. Only those in the, very, in the top third, those who have college educations and above, are able to uh, telecommute. Nearly a, a third of those, wor- of those uh, uh, upper income workers are able to telecommute, and, and for some groups, it's as high as uh, almost 50%. Uh, but really, it's very very uh, uh, graduated according to education level in our society. It doesn't respect race uh, or class. It's all about education when it comes to the labor force. Talking with the great Rob Scott here on the Jeff Santos Show. You can check him out uh, at uh, Rob Scott underscore EPI on Twitter. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can uh, follow him right here every Thursday here on the Jeff Santos Show from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, let, me, let me ask you this, Rob. Do you sense that there is um, a disconnect still with some in the Democratic Party who believe that they can get away with, okay, we vaccinated 100,000 millions of people, whatever it is, and they're not going to give it, uh, thankfully, to the rest of the world. And that, uh, well, you know, everything else will just have to sort of, you know, uh, let it uh, let it trickle it down as we have done over the last uh, 40 years in Washington and America, trickle-down theory, which, of course, never trickled down uh, to the working class. Is there that in Washington, D.C., that mentality, because if that is, that's a loser for me. Uh, and I think it's been a proven a loser for Obama, who got destroyed in 2010 for Clinton in 94. Uh, you know, you're going to have to really show the investment that was shown by Biden in this first COVID relief act. Uh, but, you know, if you don't do more of it, people are going to stay home or they're going to vote for the other side, you know, depending upon how you, you vote in normal. Uh, you know, if you're a swing voter or if you're a Democrat, a really hard uh, core progressive, you're going to stay home because, you know, you're not getting enough. Uh, your view on that. Uh, let me put this in crude political terms, uh, Jeff. The only way that, uh, that President Biden is going to hang on to his electoral, his narrow electoral uh, and congressional uh, majority in the House and the Senate, uh, and it's a it's a, a few vote majority in the House and, and a tie in the Senate when it's only offset by the votes of uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, on on a limited number of, uh, of items, as you know, and we've discussed. Uh, the only way he hangs on to that narrow advantage in 2022 is if the economy is running hot next summer. Uh, that's the only way we get there. And, uh, frankly, it's life or death uh, for the Democrats right now. And, again, Mitch McConnell knows that he's going he's gonna to dig in tooth and nail and do everything he can to block any kind of additional spending be above and beyond the American Recovery Act. Uh, and the, the, we are desperately in need of that additional spending on the infrastructure plan and the American Families Plan that's lined up uh, like an airplane, a 747 coming in behind it. Uh, those are the key pieces of spending legislation in the president's budget, which he just announced last Friday, uh, that's, that is going to sustain the economy into 2022 and beyond. Otherwise, the spending in the American Recovery Plan is going to run out. It's going to run out in the middle of next year, just in time to smash the economy flat as a pancake, and with it, the prospects of a Democratic Party uh, going forward after 2022. The only way we're going to recover is to get the economy to run hot next summer and beyond. Well, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think you've laid it out very well, uh, as you normally do here every Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Look, I mean, the facts are, I mean, you're looking at the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Uh, you know, people want to see action. And, and if they don't see action, if they see, once again, Republicans looking to punt, looking to delay, looking to do the four-corner offense, all that nonsense... Look, you're from a great uh, a basketball state, uh, the Hoosiers and so forth. Uh, you know, if you play that game, you're going to get burnt. You know, I mean, you know, that's why they get the 20-second, 30-second clock in the NBA and I think 40 seconds in the college game, whatever. And, you know, you're not going to be able to play that game. Um, and the American people will reward the Democrats if they call out the Republicans for basically, uh, you know, destroying progress. But they're going to have to offer something that they're going to say, all right, you're giving us the opportunity here. We're going to have to do things 
utilizing uh, the end of the filibuster. And that is going to be, be more economic help. That's going to be help to getting D.C. statehood. That's going to be packing the Supreme Court because all those decisions are economic decisions as well as social issues that go to the Supreme Court. And the last guy that should have been arrested after what he did on January 6th had three of them. Not one, not two, but three of them. And this guy was not even a, a majority elected by the popular vote in 2016. So to me, it's all there. You know, if the Democrats show the contrast and the way to do it, is not to play the culture war. The way to do it is to show people the money. What did our friends, you know, in Jerry Maguire sh- sh- say? Show me the money, Cuba Gooding Jr. That's what the average American who makes 35 grand a year is saying to Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Show me the money. Are you going to give me money? Are you going to help? What is it going to be? A good job and a good wage with a union salary? Is it going to be 2K a month? Is it going to be a $15 minimum wage, which, you know, you know the Delaware senators and the New Hampshire senators said no to? And never mind about uh, Cinema and the other person, uh, Manchin, won't even talk about his name, Tester and, and, and Angus King from Maine, too. I mean, to me, this is, this is where we're at. Um, and frankly... And again, you've laid this out. That's that's where the game is. I couldn't agree more, Jeff. Uh, you know, to get real here in Washington, uh, frankly, uh, out beyond the Beltway, nobody cares what happens about uh, in, in Washington about the politics, uh, about the uh, bipartisanship between the Republicans and the Democrats, and whether there's a filibuster rule or not. What they care about is whether they have a job tomorrow and a job next summer that's going to put right. the kids uh, through school, pay the rent, and put food on the table. And that's what the Democrats have to have to deliver. And frankly, they have to put this, put aside the political shenanigans and uh, do what it's going to take to to get the uh, the infrastructure bill and the American family plan through Congress. And that means uh, playing hardball politics and using the reconciliation process to, pu- to pass these two big multi-trillion dollar bills and put them into place so uh, to, we can uh, drive a stake through the heart of uh, Mitch McConnell and all his friends in the Republican Party. If we can get the economy running hot next November, November of 22, uh, we have a good chance of taking over larger numbers of seats in the House and the Senate and cementing the Democratic majority. Then we can move on to address some of the concerns that you and I both share about things like the filibuster uh, and uh, uh, civil rights and the voting rights reform and these other issues that are so essential to the to Democratic uh, voters. It's so critical. Uh, we're talking with the great uh, Rob Scott here on the Jeff Santos Show. Uh, he sent me an article this morning that I uh, had a chance to uh, to look at. That's from uh, Greg Sargent of the Washington Post. And it, it, it goes like this. The message is that if Republicans reject uh, the idea of a $1 trillion, which is ridiculously low, uh, um, you know, proposal that is supposed to be the bipartisan reach, it should be unavoidably clear that Republicans are beyond hope beyond hope as a governing partner on any terms that Manchin himself would find acceptable. And again, the bar is extremely low. It was like below sea level uh, with Manchin. If so, it's time to move to passage of a bill via the simple majority reconciliation process. But that's not all. If, If this is so, it's also time to seriously debate reforming the filibuster. I think he is spot on. Uh, you know, this 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 idea of of going on and on and on, uh, you know, to, to appease a handful of Republicans, uh, you know, is a waste of space. Couldn't agree more, Jeff. Uh, you know, I think there's a real co- coherent strategy here to do everything possible to try and help uh, Joe Manchin cut a deal with the Republicans on infrastructure. Uh, but the, I think uh, Biden has also set a real bottom line. This has got to be a trillion dollars of new spending. It's got to be paid for with taxes on corporations, not regressive user fees on uh, poor consumers, which is what the Republicans want to do by expanding the gas tax, for example. So uh, it's got to be real uh, tax increases on, on, on the rich, and uh, it's got to be real increases in spending. And I think Biden goes uh, and this and uh, Manchin are in agreement on that, 
And if Manchin can't come up with the 60 votes needed to make that happen, then he's going to have a very hard time explaining to the president why he's going to continue to insist on this outdated uh, addiction to the, to the filibuster, which, after all, is not something that's in the Constitution. It's simply a construct of the Senate and nothing more. It's a gentleman's agreement, and those can be changed, as the Republicans have done every time they wanted to put through uh, any kind of uh, priority for the Republican Party. You know, another thing, too, that really annoys me, too, and, and this doesn't get a lot of attention from mainstream media, and that is what Republican governors are doing. Uh, as you report uh, and your colleagues, uh, Nick and Caroline, report, uh, last month's number was a disappointing 266,000, something uh, closer to 1 million was expected on the jobs reports with all the spending from the American Rescue Plan. This was used as an excuse by Republican governors to slash unemployment benefits, claiming that people did not want to go back to work, which is, well, frankly, uh, a lot of BS. There are just too many legitimate health and safety concerns and too many people with child care and family responsibilities, plus I think a lack of access to child care uh, under continuing COVID risks, especially in the black and brown communities, that is a very real constraint on increasing levels of unemployment. This is what happens, and this is the long-term effect to African Americans, Latinos, white Americans, that you will get Republican governors, if you allow the uh, Senate Bill 1 to not be passed, to not not uh, renege on the filibuster. And the American government leaders and people in Hollywood, LeBron James and the athletic community, they all got to make this very clear because that economic number will not improve. In fact, it will destroy you because in a place like Florida where they don't offer, and our friend Peter from Florida will always uh, understand this, they give you a pittance compared to New York or California or here in Massachusetts of unemployment numbers. And now they're going to cut it even more? I mean, this is criminal behavior, and that's why I, I call the Republican Party the criminal uh, party, and people like Manchin and, and Abbott in Texas, you know, are, should be behind bars for what they are doing to their citizenry. Your thoughts, because this doesn't get reported at all on mainstream uh, TV, and, and, and outside of a couple of articles in the New York Times, doesn't make it there either. No, that's absolutely right, Jeff. And the strategy of the Republican Party of slashing uh, unemployment benefits is is really a double whammy for voters in in these states. They're not only denying desperately needed unemployment benefits to out of work workers, and remember there are at least 11 million of those, but they're also cutting off that spending in their own state economies. It's going to make their economies worse. So it's a, it, it's just nonsense, all for political purpose. Well said, my man. Rob Scott will be with us at the top of the hour, folks. We'll take your phone calls. We'll go to Mark in San Francisco after the break. You're tuned in to the Jeff Santos Show on The Revolution.